Hi everybody and welcome back to Cheatash. My name is Chris and today we're going to be talking about the bell curve chapter 6 all about schooling and how IQ correlated with your ability to finish high school. Specific, so we're talking about specifically getting a diploma, graduating from high school. And this kind of ties together with the theme of this whole part too, right? Social, social issues in America, behavioral issues in America. Last week we talked about poverty. Today we're talking about schooling. Chapter one, we talked about schooling. Remember that was in regards to college and the trends in college. Uh, we Those same themes are going to be kind of covered today in this schooling section. But again, talking specifically about high school. Let's jump right into it, guys. The authors start off the chapter on this note, uh, and they say this. Of all the social behaviors that might be linked to cognitive ability, school dropout prior to high school graduation is the most obvious. And I think about this when I was growing up myself, you know, there was a stigma about the high school dropout. And there was pressure from parents, although probably not as much even when I was in high school, because it's still, the the stigma was, yeah, mo- you're going to graduate high school. Like you almost have to try not to graduate high school, right? But there was a stigma of those, and I, I'm pretty sure I, there was a few kids from my class who uh, did not end up getting a high school diploma, uh, did not end up graduating at first. I don't know if they went back, uh, but there is that stigma amongst them that, hey, this, these kids are not that smart. You know, and, I, and the authors kind of talk about, well, there there is a good reason for that, and it kind of partially is true as what we are going to see from this chapter. But dropping out is relatively a recent concept. You know, they talk about in the book how early America, in the one-room schoolhouse America, you didn't really drop out. There was no formal grades, really. I mean, America was mostly agricultural society. And we even saw this back in chapter one, right? When we talk about um, IQ amongst uh, people applying, going to college, graduating from college. And most people didn't go to college. So there was a lot of very, very smart people, high cognitive ability people who were just farmers. You know, they, I don't know if they didn't have interest in it, but it didn't seem like that was an option for them. And then all of a sudden, We talked about some of the reasons it started to increase and more brighter people ended up going to college. Travel had a big impact on that and just these colleges and these faraway places, Northeast, et cetera, became opened up to the small little farm girl who was very, very bright in Kansas. You know, so now it just opens up opportunities, right? But dropping out, kind of a more recent concept. So they talk about there's this thing called the graduation ratio, which is calculated as the percentage of uh, the 17-year-old population that gets a diploma or graduates. Right In 1900, it was 6%. And it did not surpass the 50% mark until World War II, actually. So pretty long time. And we're going to see in this next graph here that there was this huge growth from the 20s all the way to the early 60s. Only kind of interrupted by World War II. But the graduation ratio steadily increased. So for those who are just listening to this, we have a graph here. In the first half of the century, the high school diploma becomes the norm. So years on the x-axis, graduation ratio in percentage terms on the y. And you have from early 1900s to about 1964, a pretty steady increase uh, with a pretty major jump 
right around the mid-1920s. So th there's two trend lines here from 1908 to 1922, and then from 1922 to 1964. And when this book was written, uh, the graduation ratio, kind of about the same as it was in 1964. There's been this kind of stagnation period in those third, that 30 years between 64 and when the book was written. So I see this as, you know, er, those early 20s, you're talking about the roaring 20s, right? Before the Great Depression. So excess, um, irrational exuberance, maybe. Um, schooling becomes more more available to those who can go to school, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and maybe... Maybe the Roaring Twenties, that, that doesn't really tell the tale of this graph and why these trend lines were uh, the kind of the way they were. Uh, but let's continue on. Educating the ineducable. It's kind of a weird word to say. The ineducable. Um, so educating beyond a kid's ability. There was actually this thought, you know, because again, dropping out, was seen as a relatively recent thing, there was this thought that, hey, should we just let kids drop out? It's kind of what I'm taking. This is all on page 145. Americans today take it for granted that the goal is to graduate everyone, that a high school dropout rate is a social evil, right? There's a socially enforced pressure to stay in school at least get your high school diploma, right? At least get your bachelor's, you know, if we're talking about in today's terms. But there was a lot of people that thought, well, are we are we trying to educate these kids who probably won't even retain this knowledge, right? For example here, let me read you something. The lower classes should be guided, not educated, said Voltaire. And even in this early century, many observers feared that unqualified youngsters were being educated beyond their ability. So it's like we're, we're, we're not going to get anywhere by educating these people, right? Educating these kids. Um, but that, that's not really what it's like today. Today, it's like, no, everybody's going to graduate. Like, no child left behind. Like, we all need to do really, really good. And kind of what the authors are kind of getting at here is that, is it, are there some instances where you're just not going to get through to some kids because of the barriers in cognitive ability, kind of? Uh, but there's some authors who think that this doesn't exist, namely this guy, Frank Finch, that they talked about, uh, who looked at some studies uh, from 1916 to 1942, and he found that there was no increasing trend over time in IQ between dropouts and graduates. So he found the mean IQ of ninth graders in these studies was 105. Mean IQ of 12th graders or graduates was 107. Trivially different. Okay. And again, no significant difference in IQ between the dropouts and the graduates. Well, the authors are going to kind of disagree a little bit in that. And their data from looking at the NLSY is going to tell a different story here. Oh, yeah, and here's the last point. On this slide, high school diploma becomes the norm. Dropouts becoming increasingly selected for by IQ. Think about this in today's terms in the bachelor's degree. That's kind of the stereotype. The bachelor's degree has become the high school diploma now, so to speak. I, I've heard that mentioned many, many times. Um, and I know that I get asked from my parents, like, hey, are you going back for your master's? You know, continuing your education. And yeah, I definitely... And for continuing your education, like if it makes a difference, if you know it'll make a difference. I was in a master's program where I realized it wouldn't have made a difference, so I stopped 
I'm kind of glad I did. But that's neither here nor there. The gap, so yes, the authors are going to talk about here, there is a gap between high school dropouts and graduates. There was a study in Iowa that found a 10-point gap in IQ between dropouts and high school graduates. A 1949 study of 2,600 students who had been given an IQ test in the seventh grade, and it found a gap between the graduates and non-graduates of about 13 IQ points, which is pretty darn close to one standard deviation uh, in IQ, which is pretty significant. And then there was studies from uh, data from the Project Talent, the large nationally representative sample of high school students mentioned back when we were talking about Chapter 1. And they saw almost a 16 IQ point difference. So there's there's other studies that kind of challenge this fact that it hasn't changed. And we come to this table. Well, who drops out of high school these days? This is data from the NLSY. Uh, and as you can see here, failure to get a high school education among whites. And again, this is just for white students. So you have the five cognitive classes and the percentage from those classes who did not graduate or pass a high school equivalency exam, a GED. For the bright and very bright classes, virtually everybody got a degree got, or got the diploma, right? But look at as you move normal, even that, like pretty much everybody got the diploma. Only 6% did not graduate. But then for the dull and very dull, tells a very different story. The percentage increases. 35% of the dull student population and then 55% for the very dull. Now, granted, I don't know how many students this is. Uh, it could, the dull and very dull groups could be a very, very small minority. Okay, that's very fair. But it still says something. If you're in those cognitive classes, it's going to be tough to graduate and get your diploma. I mean, isn't that kind of what it's saying? And I guess we have to define what it means to get your diploma. Like, what does it mean to have a high school education? Because there's also this thing called the GED, where you take a high school equivalency uh, exam and you get this GED that says, hey, I have a high school equivalent, although I did not get my high school diploma in the normal amount of time. Or, or I think even sometimes you can graduate from high school sooner. And that's also a GED. I'd have to look that up. But uh, in, in the previous table, so in the previous table, we included the GEDs, right? But GEDs are not necessarily equivalent to normal graduates. As we're going to talk about, the GEDs look more like dropouts, especially when it comes to their their futures and when they go into the labor market and wages and jobs. Right, but they do resemble graduates as far as IQs, but they look more like the dropouts in as far as opportunities. So GED students in 1968, GED graduates accounted for only 5% of all high school certifications, but by 1980, that proportion had reached more than 13%. Where, his, where it has remained with minor fluctuations ever since. And as the authors found here, white students with GEDs in the NLSY had an average IQ of zero of a half standard deviation lower than the average for white high school graduates. So better, you know, than somebody who completely dropped out, permanent dropouts, but still lacking behind in IQ, in terms of standard deviations. So what do we know from permanent dropouts? Here we have our first line graph, the famous bell curve line graphs here that we will be accustomed to seeing a lot of. In predicting which white youths will never complete a high school education, 
IQ is more important than SES. So they're comparing here just like they did in the last chapter. IQ and SES and predicting dropouts. And as you can see here, two lines, look at for the very low end of the standard deviations. Two standard deviations below the mean of SES, so very poor versus very dull. And look at that percentage difference there in, in dropping out. You're talking about a 40% difference. And for those with very low IQ, the chances of dropping out like mid 65%, 64%, as opposed to very low socioeconomic status, just 20%, which is still 20% is high. You're talking about almost one in four, right, of, of people in this background, right? But if you're looking at this graph, you're almost thinking, well, it's better, it's, it's better to have the higher IQ, or at least it's better to come from a lower socioeconomic background, right? You do not want to have low cognitive ability in this case. So now that's for the permanent dropouts, right? IQ, way, way more of a difference uh, than the socioeconomic status. But for the temporary dropouts, it flips. And you actually have parental socioeconomic status being more of a factor in getting a GED than the high school diploma. Or, or excuse me, more of a factor in getting the GED than IQ. It's very interesting. Um, again, two lines here, one IQ, one parental SES. And for the very low classes of comparing very low IQ to very low parental SES, the chances of getting the GED for a very low parental SES way higher than for a very low IQ. So very, very interesting here. It flips, and how, why does it kind of flip? Let's go to the next slide, the difference in the graphs here. Temporary dropouts in GED achievements are more predicted through parental SES than student IQ. So GEDs are more like normal graduates in terms of IQ, but more like dropouts in terms of labor success. We've mentioned that before. And how that there's this myth about the bright dropout, like the person who man, just school isn't for me, but they're really, really smart, and they go on to be very innovative, start a company, be a difference maker in the world. I mean, that sounds good in movies and stuff, but the tale from the graphs and the NLSY is not telling that same story, right? So what, what was the question that I, I was asking before? Why for the GED is there this flip and all of a sudden parental SES? Uh, is way more predictive for the GED as well. First, there are middle upper class parents who find it unthinkable that their children should drop out of high school. Uh, then there's working class parents who are somewhere around the mean on the socioeconomic index, urging their children to get an education and do better than their parents. And then finally, one thinks of lower class parents who th think, oh, why are my children even bothering with all this book learning? And the authors continue to write here. I'm reading from the book here, page 151. The NLSY data are consistent with though these popular images. For youths with a socioeconomic background anywhere near or above the mean, the high school diploma is the norm. A socioeconomic background falls below the mean. The probability that the high school certification came through GED instead of the normal route soars. Let me go back. Sorry. SES and IQ interact. The authors do make this point. So they're not mutually exclusive. And I, th I hope I'm using that word right. If you are in the bottom centiles of both, it's worse. They interact with each other. So if you're in the bottom categories of both, it's going to be worse than if you're just in the bottom of one or the other. Now let's continue on. Next graph, the comparative role of IQ 
and family background and getting a college degree. So for those just listening, we have this chart for white youths, being smart is more important than being privileged and getting a college degree. So look at this. Below the mean for parental SES or IQ, it's going to be tough to get a, a bachelor's degree either way. Once you cross the mean for both IQ and parental SES, IQ is going to make more of that difference in getting the bachelor's degree. And this is shown by, again, another line graph, two lines, one line representing parental SES and the other line representing IQ. And again, when they show graphs like this, the tendency is when you're looking at one line, one variable, they're holding the other variable to the mean, right? So IQ going from low to high, they're holding parental SES at the mean and then vice versa for parental SES. So IQ makes way bigger of a difference, way more of a difference in getting that college degree. So, th so this is what the NLSY was saying about various degree attainment. We have high school graduates with a mean IQ of 106, college graduates with a mean IQ of 116, and then professional degrees with a, a mean of 126. So this seems like the different standard deviations. You have high school graduates right around the mean. College graduates are probably closer to one standard deviation above the mean. And then professional degrees, two, three standard deviations above. Um, and these are, and who knows, maybe th these numbers have probably changed a little bit too in today's world. So this data kind of mimics what they saw in the 50s and 60s all generated from a book on the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale. So maybe data from the 50s and 60s, this data from the 90s, 80s, 90s, maybe it's pretty similar today and just, again, we're, I think the phrase that we've used before is America is getting, there's a lot of efficiency in getting the smartest people to college. Those with high cognitive ability have no issues getting into these places, right? They're, the system is working for them. It, they're being sorted and partitioned along these lines of cognitive ability. So there's that, this uh, stigma, right? I've used that word a lot in this, this video, stigma. Only seven-tenths of a percent of the whites in the NLSY had IQs of 115 or above and were from the bottom quartile of the socioeconomic index. Although of this group, 46% got college degrees. Huh. Okay. Next point, almost 5% of whites who had IQs under 100 were in the top quartile of SES. And of those, only 12% had gotten college degrees, representing just six-tenths of 1% of the white youths. So what does this say? To me, this kind of says, hey, in the first point, the first bullet point, if you were smart, you could overcome that socioeconomic status. And possibly the reason that you don't and you don't get that college degree is because your cognitive ability is lacking anyway. It has, no, I don't want to say it has nothing, but it, the socioeconomic factor is not the main factor here. And then oppositely, for the second point, you know, this, the stereotype is, oh, somebody's privileged, well off, that's going to get them through school and they're going to use their connections. But if they're not smart, those connections, that high socioeconomic status, the privileged background is not going to make that much of a difference according to this data. So let's summarize here, guys. The act of leaving high school before graduating is concentrated in the lowest quartile of cognitive ability. We kind of saw that. Comparing the permanent dropouts, temporary dropouts. And for the temporary dropouts, again, we saw that parental socioeconomic status more of a factor than the child or the 
the young person's IQ. But for permanent dropouts, yeah, IQ made the bigger difference than socioeconomic status. SES can help someone who is reasonably bright, but there are limits if they are not bright. Again, we kind of saw this through the line graphs. And then if cognitive ability is high, socioeconomic status disadvantage is not seen as a barrier to getting a degree. So guys, that concludes our video for today. Thank you so much if you listened this far. I really, really appreciate it. Please like and subscribe. We are going to be doing more and more bell curve now that we finished with winning in mind. So coming out next week, hey, chapter seven of the bell curve. Uh, hope you guys like the with winning in mind videos. And we're just going to be heavy on the bell curve. I am almost done with the book, although the videos are lagging behind. And then fairly soon, I don't know, maybe in like about a month or two, month or two I am going to be starting a new book. So I'm, I have an idea of what it is, and I'm kind of excited to start that. But we got to get through this first, guys. Thank you very much again. If you have questions, comments, please put them down below. Let's have a conversation. Let's start a dialogue. Till next time, my name is Chris. This has been Cheetash. Take care.